Award-winning actor Michael J. Fox was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 1991 at just 29 years old. It's a progressive brain disorder that over time can strip away a person's movement and speech. Now, there's been some headway since he created his foundation on Parkinson's research back in 2000. But what's the latest and what more can be done for the estimated 1 million Americans who have this disease? Welcome to Healthy Living, Wellness and Prevention, Medical Innovation, the Informed Side of Care. Welcome to Baptist Health Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Janot, your host for today's discussion, coming to you from the Baptist Health Newsroom. I'm here with today's guest, Anna Velasco, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's in her early 40s and has taken the disease by the horns and received treatment that has allowed her to live a normal life. Here to talk about what living with Parkinson's disease looks like alongside Anna is Chief of Movement Disorders at Baptist Health Miami Neuroscience Institute, Dr. Diego Torres Rosoto. Thank you both for being here today with us. Thank you Appreciate for inviting that. us. Thank you. Now, before we dive into today's subject, I want to remind those that are watching now to send in your questions in the comments. Remember, we're here for you and happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, now let's jump right into the basics here. Uh, Dr. Torres, tell us a little bit more about the disease. How does it affect people and what are the early signs and symptoms? Thank you, David. Um, you know, Parkinson's disease is a very common disorder. About 1% of the population suffers from this condition. It's a neurodegenerative disease. What that means is that the brain cells are you know, slowly being uh, affected and damaged by the illness. And as uh, all of that is occurring, then the patients uh, start accumulating uh, new problems and new symptoms. The diagnostic criteria for, for this condition uh, include basically three things that we look for, but they can present in many ways. For example, stiffness is one. And, you know, stiffness can present in many ways. It could be a stiffness of the neck, a difficulty moving your arms or your legs, getting up from bed, things like that. Then you have slowness, um, and we call that bradykinesia. And that can present in many ways, like smaller handwriting, uh, difficulty moving your arms in a natural fashion when you are walking. Uh, also, um, you know, slowness overall on your speech or in, you know, decreasing your facial expressions. And then lastly, we have tremors. And uh, tremors only occur in about 60% of the patients with Parkinson's disease. So, you know, about a third of patients don't have any shaking whatsoever. Um, so that one is not required, but it's very common. And it's a very special type of tremor. Um, the disease affects the patients in, in many ways. Uh, so the tremors can make you, you know, have sometimes clumsiness uh, mm. around the things that you're doing. It can affect your handwriting. The way you communicate your speech, your voice can be um, altered uh, in many ways. Um, and uh, as the disease progresses, then you can have also uh, postural instability, uh, falling, you know, difficulty walking, uh, difficulty initiating uh, ambulation, which we call freezing of gait. Um, and uh, later on, at the uh, later stages of the disease, some patients, about 20 to 30 percent of them, could even develop uh, dementia. Wow. I, I'm sure some, some of that is, is relatable. Anna, tell us a little bit about your journey when you were diagnosed with the disease. How did you learn that something might be going on? Well, I'll start with a twitching in my eye, mm -hmm. something that normal people say, oh, it's just stress or something that you won't think it's Parkinson's. And then it went gradually taking more of my body, my finger, my hand, my arm, my foot, my leg. I'm a runner. And my, I said, my, my leg has a mind of her own. I couldn't run. I would tell my, my leg, move my leg. Just no, I don't feel like it. Wow. That's when I said, okay, I got to see a doctor. I went to see a doctor February 14th. Valentine's Day, and I said, okay, I have, go and go see the doctor. And the doctor said, I have Parkinson's. So that's how I was diagnosed here in Miami. I went to a neurologist, and this neurologist, uh, he forwarded me, he referred me to a moving disorder doctor. And I went to see Dr. Torres, and here I am. Now, as a progressive and degenerative disease, what are the, the stages of Parkinson's? So how quickly um, are the symptoms? Do they come and how severe do they get? 
You know, that's a great question, David. Uh, the, and, and I'm very passionate about that particular topic because patients always wonder, in what phase am I? You know, where am I? What's the stage of my disease? And in all honesty, I don't feel that the staging is as useful in terms of the care that we provide to the patients and how they feel. Uh, you know, for example, when some of our patients come and they arrive the first day in the clinic, they might, they might be at a moderate level of severity. So we say, okay, right now the stage would be three. But if we start appropriate medications so that they can feel a lot better, some of these patients might, you know, be looking down to just a stage one, sort of almost normal or normal because of the benefit from the medications. In the same way for, you know, the, the uh, advanced therapies that we that we can provide, um, you know, the data shows that they get about 50% improvement of their symptoms. Uh, so the staging is not as helpful, uh, I don't feel, um, you know, for our patients, but it's important that they know that whatever they are suffering from, we can, you know, try and help them. And we have many options available to help them so that they don't have to stay in that situation and so that we can help them improve their quality of life. Anna, talk to us about that moment when you got that Parkinson's diagnosis. What, um, what, what made you think that you could fight this knowing that there wasn't a cure? Oh, it's um, when I was diagnosed, the first moment is really hard. It's like you feel like your world just crumbles down and like the Twin Towers. But you have two options in life. You either go and take the bull by the horns or you let it, you just die. It's like you're driving a car and you got to be the driver. You can't be just the passenger. And let it, the disease is, is, is a car. So I said, no, I'm not going to put up with this. I got worse, 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 because you have, it's a process. It's, it's sure. something, it's inevitable. But um, when you see that you wake up in a morning routine, you can't brush your teeth, you can't button your shirt, you can't brush your hair, you can't, there's so many things you can't do because your body every day is getting worse and worse. The things you take for granted. Yeah, exactly. And then you say, no, 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 I got to do this. I got to do this. And I started working hard and I said, I'm, I'm not the type of person that goes into internet and look and searches for information because sometimes you get the wrong information. It be a very dangerous thing to do. So sometimes. I have family who are doctors who tell me no. So I went and I asked Dr. Torres and I look, I just, I know what I want to do. I want to get better. I need to get better. My work was getting, getting slappy and I was slow. My postures, just my back hurt. Your, your body aches from the bottom of your, your crown of your head mm. down to your feet. So you can, some days it's hard for you to move. You're tired. You don't have the strength. It's like your battery runs down Thursday. I couldn't have any more battery for the rest of a week. Oh. So I, I couldn't live. I'm, I'm not that young. I'm 50. I'm 52. But I, I, I was not going to put up with it. No, not that many people know this, but as a neurological disorder, there's a link between Parkinson's and dementia. And I know maybe this might have been on your mind at the time, but uh, if every if anybody that has uh, Parkinson's, does that mean that they're going to get dementia? Mm, no. So the, there is a link, um, you know, between this disease and uh, and uh, cognitive uh, problems and dementia. But uh, about. Uh, about a third of patients uh, uh, might develop dementia with it uh, as, as the disease progresses. But the majority of patients uh, don't have any, um, you know, severe uh, alteration of, of the way they are thinking. However, uh, many do feel that the, the way they are thinking or their, their, the speed of thinking, um, the speed of processing, is different than before the disease start. And uh, uh, there are many things that we can do to, you know, to help with uh, some of those uh, symptoms. But we, uh, at uh, every um, comprehensive multidisciplinary Parkinson's disease center in the US, we screen for any cognitive abnormality in all, you know, for all of our patients, basically. And make sure that we keep an eye on, 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 on that whole situation. Now, Anna, you decided to undergo surgery uh, to help relieve some of your symptoms. Talk to us about deep brain stimulation surgery and how it helped you get back to the normal things that you were doing before your di diagnosis. 
It has been the best decision of my life, honestly. I mean, it's it, it changes you 100%. It's just, it gives you a second chance. That's what I say. Um, I think, I know it's not for everybody, but I think everybody should look up for that option. And I think, no, I don't think I'm 100% sure that I was on the right hands. Uh, the DBS, I just had it. I mean, I'm, it's reason, but honestly, I can paint, I can ride, I can ride my bicycle. I got back, my, my balance wow. is just like, for me, that it's incredible. Um, everything in general is just, the it's DBS you back is, so much. the DBS is, is the way. Who doesn't try to do it because they're scared, because it's a surgery that, because it's, it's a tendency that people say, oh, it's a surgery, you're awake. I'm terrified of needles, terrified. I can just freak out. But that, if I have to go through that again, let's go. I'll do it. What, it depends how you take it. What do you want? You want your life or you want to give up? I'm not going to, I'm never going to give up. up. You're a fighter. Yeah. That's awesome. Now we, we talked a little bit earlier about the early signs and symptoms. Now let's talk about the movement, uh, non-movement symptoms that also come with having this disease, such as problems with planning and irritability. Yeah. So, um, you know, as you're enduring a disease, um, uh, you know, you have extremely courageous uh, people like Anna, uh, who you know, uh, that's their personality, and they you know they want to go and conquer their health and their quality of life back. Um, but some patients, uh, about uh, forty to fifty percent, develop apathy, um, and that's very common uh, in this disease. About a third of the patients can also have depression, and it's not it's not so much geez, I'm depressed because I got diagnosed with a disease that is affecting my quality of life is also that, you know, the same process that alters the movement of the patients is affecting other processes inside the brain and with that producing mood disorders. Uh, the patients can also have anxiety. Um, so there are changes in personality. Uh, there are mood and anxiety disorders that come with this condition. And then you can have sleep disorders that can affect really the quality of life of our patients. Um, and uh, you can have drooling, uh, what we call sialuria, uh, where you know some patients are not swallowing uh, uh, normally. Mm -hmm. And because of that, accumulate uh, some saliva or they have difficulty handling uh, the secretions uh, in the mouth. And, uh, you know, those things can be really problematic for some of the patients uh, and affect them in, you know, socially and, and also uh, personally. So the disease, as you can see, as you mentioned, you have all of these symptoms, motor, non-motor symptoms. And therefore, the only way of really being able to provide uh, uh, improvement, uh, a real improvement on the patient's uh, situation is to look at the whole patient mm -hmm. as a person, to understand them in their environment. What are they doing? How is this disease affecting their work, their family life, their personal life? Um, you know, what are their thoughts? How are things going? They require multidisciplinary care um, to be able to give them back their lives. Now, Anna, having been diagnosed uh, with Parkinson's disease, what do you want people to know about living with Parkinson's disease? Living with Parkinson's disease is taking a day at a time where you have the choice to give up or to fight. It's all, it's a combination. It's not only doctors and medications, and surgery. it's your attitude because you can give up. You always, with anything, with any type of condition, what do you want to do? You want to live or you want to give up? Um, just be strong and every day is different just because you had a bad day today, tomorrow, probably an amazing day, or it could change even from the morning to the afternoon. So just do what is better for you, whatever your heart tells you, but seek if they're doctors who have studied if they're researchers, I, w I was saying at the surgery from the beginning, I said, I was thinking, I said, during the surgery, the first one for the DBS, I said, Dr. Spore said, what happened? I said, I, want, I was thinking, he said, what? I said, the people who started the research, who created the DBS, the people who were the guinea pigs, mm -hmm. that were still being guinea pigs, and the doctors who dared to do it, 
doctors like Dr. Torres that appoint according to the symptoms that they see or everything, that's what you need to do. You, you have a car, your car breaks down, you take it to the mechanic, right? Yeah. Same thing. We, our body is a car, they're the mechanics. They study and they help you. So there are options and never give up. I, I love your mindset and honestly that positivity and that like keep going and keep fighting might be the, the best medicine, you know, so that's great. And now we're in the part where we can go ahead and answer some of the more top researched questions that we see on the internet. And this one has been kind of on my mind as well. Uh, the first question is, what is the life expectancy of someone with Parkinson's? Uh, that's a, a very important question and uh, um, a common one as well. Um, so the life expectancy for Parkinson's disease is, is basically normal, is, is, is almost non-affected. Mm -hmm. Uh, in average, our patients with Parkinson's disease might live one or two years less than the average general population. Um, so it's basically unaffected. Uh, the disease usually is not what is going to kill our patients, right? Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, it's other conditions that the patients might have, a heart problem, a stroke, you know, falls, uh, trauma, things like that. But the disease itself is not, you know, it's not going to affect mortality directly in a significant way. It's not a death sentence. As we talked about earlier, Michael J. Fox, he's been, you know, living with this for over 30 years, and he's still opening people's eyes to, to this and, and, and not leaving the one million people uh, suffering with this behind. So um, the, the next question here is, what happens if Parkinson's is left untreated? You know, um, when this disease was uh, described, uh, few years ago, more than 100 years ago, um, the patients were definitely uh, dying from the disease in a, in a state that was not comfortable. Um, uh, they would be frozen, uh, slowed uh, down to a point of, you know, not walking, not moving, uh, having difficulties with swallowing, with eating, with truly living their lives. Um, and um, even severe difficulties of speech. Um, but uh, we have had now uh, medications for, you know, dozens of years for Parkinson's disease that truly improve that uh, reality. And we have just so many options uh, in terms of medications, injections, procedures, um, and, uh, you know, many more uh, things that we do to improve the quality of life. So um, uh, the, the reality of Parkinson's now is completely transformed. And one of the most important things that I remind people uh, is the power of exercising and uh, the power of enhancing physical activity. And, um, you know, we talk, I, I try to talk about that with my patients in most visits uh, because it, it really can uh, transform uh, their, you know, their condition and, and the quality of, of the days that they have ahead. Yeah. It's important to stay active. Don't just sit around, try to do as much as you can, move as much as possible. Um, another top research question is what is the hardest part about living with Parkinson's? It's a limitation. It's, it, you feel like you, they take your freedom away. I mean, starting from the basic things, Binding your shirt, getting dressed, brushing teeth, writing, working, typing, stress. So many things that the Parkinson's can, they, it's like it sucks up your life in a quiet way. So I wouldn't recommend, I mean, to leave it unattended, mm -mm. no way. Wow. Um, this one I'm sure is on a lot of minds of, of uh, our viewers, on the minds of a lot of our viewers, is Parkinson's genetic. Mm. Yeah, so about, uh, you know, we would say uh, about 20% of, of the disease is genetics and your genes and your predisposition of, of getting these conditions. And about 80% is environment, is mm -hmm. what are your exposures to uh, toxics and toxins and, um, you know, chemicals and, and, and work-related exposures and the like. There are very specifically defined genetic diseases that cause Parkinson's disease. 
We have a list uh, of uh, many of these genes that if you have the mutation, your risk of developing uh, the disease is extremely high. And in some cases, if you have the mutation, you will have the disease at, you know, uh, show up at some point in your life. Um, but in general, if, say, for example, your, your father or your mother had Parkinson's, it doesn't mean that, oh, geez, I'm definitely going to have it. It increases your risk, but it's not, um, it, it, you know, it's a combination of many factors. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Torres, Anna, for sharing your insights with our audience and, and being here with us in the uh, Baptist Health Newsroom. I want to go ahead and also mention to our viewers, be sure to hit that subscribe button on our channel here to keep up with all of the latest health and wellness information and, of course, tips from our experts. Thank you so much for watching. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. Baptist Health Talk is brought to you by Baptist Health, the warmer side of care.